be in Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13, starting in verse 10. It's a very familiar passage of scripture, a very familiar story, a very familiar characters to us. At first, I felt like the Lord would have me to go in a different direction. And I want to preach on being in storms and to encourage you. But at the last minute, I received what I was supposed to preach last night. And the Lord just kind of led me in a completely different direction for tonight. So he's been training me. He's been teaching me. The Lord's been opening dates for me to preach even at our church to the adults. And I'm always thankful to, to be able to preach and to teach the gospel. Genesis chapter 13, beginning in verse 10. The Bible says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you come into Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. We know that Sodom represents the world. The Bible says that Lot was a righteous man. He was a righteous man. Like you and I, when we were born again, when we placed our faith in Christ and Him crucified, God clothed us with the righteousness of Christ. We are righteous in the eyes of God. Lot was a righteous man but there came a point in Lot's life that he had to make a choice he had to make a choice and tonight we have a choice to make church we have a choice to that we can make to live different from the world to be separate from the world the thing about Lot was he didn't even want to leave Sodom God had saved him a few different times and there still came a point that he didn't even want to leave Sodom even though it was going to be destroyed and because Lot decided to put things off, he lived the rest of his life dealing with the wages of living in Sodom. The title of this message is The Wages of Living in Sodom. And I don't want, to, I don't want you to get the wrong idea like we owe a payment for the time that we lived out in the world. But what I will tell you is if, if we continually uh, disobey God and we continue to walk in this world and to be in this world, it has a detrimental effect on our family. It has a detrimental effect on the people around us, on our co-workers, on our children. So when I say the wages of living in Sodom, I don't want you to get the wrong idea that we owe God something. Jesus already paid for the time that we lived in Sodom. Amen. Let's pray uh, one more time. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you, Lord, for once again, Lord, another night to come together and to worship you, Lord. I pray that you would help me to deliver this message, Lord, that the preacher would come, that the teacher would come, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would anoint me. Lord, anoint your people to hear and to receive the word tonight that I feel that like you have laid upon my heart, Lord. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just want to make a couple of points, really, before we get to where we're going. I want to look briefly at Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. The Bible says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, it was pleasant to her eyes. And a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. I told you all this before in a message months ago, but our eyes can deceive us. Satan was right there convincing Eve to partake of that fruit that she could be like God. And whenever she saw that it was pleasant to her eyes, she decided to eat of that fruit. Let me tell you something, partaking of the fruit will never bring you what Satan has promised. Partaking of the fruit will never bring you what Satan has promised. Satan is the master deceiver. He's the master salesman. Anyone in here ever bought a brand new car? The salesman will always tell you everything that you want to hear to make that sale, for you to make that purchase. And that's what, that's what Satan does. He transforms himself into an angel of light and tells you things that, that he knows that you want to hear. Partaking of the fruit will never bring you, but Satan has promised. And I want to look real quick, too, at Genesis chapter 12. I won't read the verses, but it was the call of Abraham. You can read it later, Genesis 12, uh, verses 1 through 3. But God called a man named Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees. Ur is the city 
and the Chaldees are the people. They are polytheistic people. They're worshiping many gods. But the one true living God called this man named Abraham. And he said, I want you to get away from your country. I want you to get away from your kindred. I want you to get away from your father's house. And I want you to go to a land that I will show you. A land that is flowing with milk and honey. But the thing about Abram is he ends up bringing things with him that God told him to leave behind. You see, God knows that when we bring things from our old life into our new life in Christ, those things will only encourage us to keep living in the land of tomorrow. What he did was he had brought his father Terah along with him. And Terah, the Bible says, he, well, he was a maker of idols. And Abram brought Terah with him. But it wasn't until Terah ended up, ended up dying that Abraham picked up the pieces and he began to move forward again with the promises of God. I believe that Jesus purchased his church. He purchased it with his blood. But there's things that we have been delivered from. But there's always, there, there always seems to be that one thing that, they, that we want to keep carrying with us. And what it does is it continually tries to pull our heart back to where we used to be. When Terah died, then he moved forward. I think there's things in our lives many times that need to die for us to move forward with the plan of God. Amen? Amen. But the whole idea is Abram was called to be separate. He wanted him to be separate. We are called to be separate from this world. We still live in this world. But we must not let the world change us and influence us and influence our decisions. Amen? Moving forward in Genesis chapter 13, there comes a point in the life of Abram and Lot that they each had grown so big that the substance, everything that they had, their herds, their flocks, their cattle, everything had grown so big that the herdsmen of Abram and the herdsmen of Lot, they end up getting into a dispute, a controversy. They end up getting into an argument and Abraham basically steps back and says, go ahead, Lot, I want you, look, if you... You go ahead and choose where you want to go first. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And the thing is, is the Bible talks about the Canaanites and the Perizzites. They were in the land at this time whenever they had got to Canaan. And those Perizzites and the Canaanites, I believe, were watching this strife. They were watching how Abraham and Lot handled this situation. And what, what I want to tell you is that people are watching how we handle our business. People are watching our lifestyle. The world is watching us. The people around us, our family is watching us. The people where we work is watching us. But Abraham and Lot ended up having to separate. But I want to look, listen, I want to look more specifically at Lot. We're going to read through the main verses again. Genesis 13, verse 10. The Bible says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan. He chose to lift up his eyes. He chose to look towards the plains of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of, of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you come unto Zor. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom, but the men of Sodom were wicked. And sinners before the Lord exceedingly, the, the people that were in Sodom, homosexuality was rampant in Sodom and Gomorrah. It really reminds me of the country that we're living in now and how we have legalized uh, homosexuality and homosexual, homosexual marriage and things like that. And it's against the word of God. It's not right. It's very wrong. But the grass always looks greener towards the world. It seems that Lot was making a choice. He really wasn't caring about eternal things. He was really caring only about the temporary. But not everything is always as it appears on the temporary because we know that God was going to end up destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot looked upon the plain of Jordan with a desire to possess the land, much like Eve looked at the fruit with a desire to eat. That's why I brought Eve into it because whenever she saw that the fruit was pleasant to her eyes. I want to tell you that our eyes can deceive us. Lot's eyes, they deceived him. He, he made a decision with where he wanted to go. I, I didn't see anywhere in the Bible where Lot was praying and seeking the Lord about well, where the Lord would have him to go. The self-will of Lot slowly took him towards Sodom. I also brought up Eve in the garden because it's like I, I see the effects of the fall in this man. 
I see the effects of the fall and how that land looked pleasant to his eyes. He's dealing with things because of the fall. Lot, walking by sight, chose on the basis of what appealed to him. He chose what appealed. Again, he did not ask God, Lord, what would you have me to do? He decided to lift up his own eyes. He decided to move his family and his herds where he thought he would want to go. Amen. And I want you to understand that first he pinched, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. He didn't walk straight on into Sodom. He didn't go right on in and buy a house. He didn't go right on in and start talking to the people. But he was living on the plain. He was living in the cities around Sodom. And it seems to me that Lot wanted access to Sodom, to the world. But he also wanted access to God. And I see that in the church many times. That the church folk really want access to God. But also want access to the world. It's almost like we got our hand over here. On the cross, and we got our foot out dabbling in the world, doing things that we shouldn't be doing. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Y'all very quiet tonight. There was a time in my life where I pitched my tent towards Sodom because I thought the grass was greener towards Sodom. And I won't tell you much about that because I've told y'all uh, my testimony many times. But whenever I was in college, I decided to, to try out the world. I had been in church my whole life, but I decided I'm going to go out and and try some things in the world. And I'm going to go out to the ballroom. And I'm going to let the people around me begin to influence me. Kind of like Lot did. Yeah. He pitched his tent towards Sodom. He pitched it toward that direction. And I found myself in that condition. And I'm very thankful that I, nothing happened to me while I was living out in the world like that. Because I don't know that I would have made it out of here had something happened to me. I'm not saying I had completely fell away from the gospel, but I was not living for the Lord like I was supposed to be. And I feel like many times that, that happens to us. We got to watch what we're looking at. We have to watch what we put before our eyes, before our children, before our family. Amen. Amen. Look at Genesis 13, 14 and 15. Genesis 13, 14 and 15. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now your eyes. See, Lot chose to lift up his eyes when he wanted to lift up his eyes. But the man of God waited. See, it's really something I didn't make mention of it. But Abraham has the, the promises of God. But it's something that he stepped back. I see Abraham's faith because he stepped back and let Lot choose where he wanted to go first. Abraham was waiting for God to tell him to lift up his eyes. And he was waiting for God to give him what he had promised him. That's what it's. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up your eyes. God tells him, lift up his eyes and look from the place where you are northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land which you see to you will I give it. Lot saw the land, Lot took the land, Abram waited on God, and God told him to lift up his eyes, and God gave him the land. For all the land which you see to you will I give it, and to your seed forever. And the Bible talks about how Abraham built an altar in Hebron. He built an altar there. We see what Abraham's faith was in. His faith was reestablished in the sacrifice. It typified the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. 2,000 years before Jesus ever, came, ever even came, we see what Abraham's faith was in. And I want to tell you that there's no altar in Sodom. There's no altar in Sodom. The Bible says that the God of this world has blinded the minds of those that do not believe. He's blinded the minds of them. They have rejected the gospel. Many people out in the world. The Bible also says for the preaching of the cross. We hear it all the time. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish. Foolishness. It's foolishness to the world. They don't want this Jesus. They just want to live the way they want to live. Pleasing the flesh. Yeah. And letting that sin nature just bend their heart towards sin. And doing acts <coughs> of sin. And, and, and being ungodly. There's a point in Abraham's life, or really uh, in Lot's life, there was a war that had broke out between some kings. And I'm not going to stay there alone. You can go back and read all this. Some of this stuff I'm paraphrasing, but if you go and read it, you will find exactly what I'm saying to be true. But there was a war that broke out with some kings, and Lot and all of his goods was taken like he was the spoils of war. 
But Abraham and 318 of his men went and rescued Lot. And I was thinking about how many times God has rescued us in the midst of circumstances that we didn't know how we were going to get out of, circumstances that could have destroyed us. But Abraham goes and he rescues Lot. But guess what Lot does? He goes right back to Sodom. How many times has the Lord rescued us and we went right back in to living out in the world? Through this message, I want you to see the grace and the mercy of God and the compassion. I think about all that Jesus has done to save us and to save his church and to save the people in this world that would accept the gospel into their heart and into their life and to allow it to do a work in them. See the grace and the mercy of God through this situation with Lot. Lot went right back to living in the land of tomorrow. I believe Lot continued to just put things off in his life. And once again, his wife and his children are seeing all the things that are going on in the midst of the situation that he has moved his family in. And there comes a point that Abraham has to intercede for Lot. He intercedes for Sodom. And he's talking to God and he says, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And Abraham starts at 50 men. If there's 50 righteous people in Sodom, will you still destroy it? The Lord says no. And he goes to 45. He goes to 40. He goes to 30, to 20, to 10. But Abraham stopped asking at 10. Abraham stopped asking before God stopped giving. Had Abraham continued to ask all the way down to one person? We know Lot was righteous. Maybe Sodom and Gomorrah, maybe it would have been saved. I don't know. I mean, the the Bible really doesn't tell us, but all I can tell you is he asked all the way down to 10 people, but evidently there wasn't even 10 righteous people that were living in Sodom. So there comes a point that, that, that God sends two angels to Sodom and Lot is sitting uh, in the, at, at the gate of the city. Uh, he could have been the mayor. We're not really sure. Normally the person that sat at the gate would have had some kind of authority. But uh, these two angels went to Sodom. And Lot ends up taking these angels and, and bringing them into his house. And uh, the, the, the people, the men older and young around Sodom had seen these two men come into the city. And they go over to Lot's house. And the Bible talks about how they were... They had surrounded the house. And the thing is, is that they wanted to know the men. They wanted to have homosexual relations with them. And Lot ends up going outside. And you know what he does? He ends up offering his two daughters to them. His two virgin daughters, the Bible says. That's what he offered instead. We see, even though Lot was a righteous man, we see the effects that Sodom had in his life. We see the effects that Sodom had on his heart and the decisions that he had made. I can't imagine. I have two daughters. I can't imagine doing something like that. And I believe that his two daughters, when they seen this situation happen, I believe that something changed inside of them also. That look at my my dad's been trying to tell me, even though we're living in Sodom, even though we're living this lifestyle, he's still been trying to tell me about God because Lot is a righteous man. I believe he was trying to tell people in the city the right way. I believe he was trying to teach his wife and his daughters the right way. But whenever he made this decision to offer up his daughters like that, I believe something changed on the inside of them. I think they saw their their dad in a, in, in a little bit different way. Look at uh, Genesis 19 verses 15 through 17. Genesis 19, 15 through 17. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened. It means that they were urging Lot, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters, which are here, lest you be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Verse 16, And while he, talking about Lot, lingered, it speaks of him delaying, of waiting, of tarrying. The men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, The Lord being merciful unto him. It speaks of compassion. The Lord was being compassionate towards him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, escape for your life. God says, look not behind you. Once again, we saw Eve looking at the fruit. We saw Lot looking 
at the plains of Jordan. And now we see God telling them, look not behind you, neither stay you in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. Even after all of that, Lot now knows that God's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he sends these angels and they're trying to get him to leave the city. And Lot still doesn't want to leave. His wife, his children, they still don't want to leave. The angels have to grab him by the arm and bring him out of the city. Get out of here. I don't know what you're not understanding, but this place is about to be destroyed. And you know what ends up happening? Lot ends up pleading uh, with God to go to Zor. He doesn't. God told him to go to the mountain. I want you to go to the mountain. I want you to get away from all of this area. And he still ends up going to one of the cities that was supposed to be destroyed. After all of that, after Abraham had done rescued him, after God done sent these angels in here to rescue him, and he still doesn't want to obey God. He still doesn't want to go the way that God wants him to go. And he ends up going to Zor. And thankfully, God ended up sparing the city of Zor. Because of Lot, because he went there. But Lot's wife, as fire and brimstone began to rain down on Sodom and Gomorrah out of heaven. And the, the city was being destroyed and smoke was going up like a furnace. The Bible says Lot's wife ends up looking, once again, looking with her eyes. She looks back at the city. And God had said, don't look back. And I believe, based on the Hebrew words and stuff, it, it seems that she kept looking back at the city. She was delivered out of Sodom, but Sodom wasn't out of her. She was gazing on it intently. She was desiring to be back over there, even though it's being destroyed. So Lot ends up leaving Zor and he, he moves to a cave. He ends up moving to a cave. Now I want you to get, think about that. Abraham and Lot had so much stuff that they had to separate from each other. All of this wealth that they had. But now Lot is reduced <laughs> to living in a cave with his two daughters. His wife is now dead. He went from a wealthy man to living in a cave. In a cave. Listen, sin takes you further than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. And it takes more than you want to give. He lost his wife. That's why I'm trying to tell you the wages of living in Sodom. It affected his family. It affected his children. It affected his wife. It affected the people around him. So his two daughters end up coming up with a plan that they're going to end up getting him drunk. And uh, it seemed, and, and Lot was just willing to get drunk. It almost seems that he was trying to drown his sorrows. Everything that had just, not just happened. Even though he was a righteous man, now we see him drinking and trying to drown his sorrows. And his two daughters end up getting him drunk. And the, the older one goes in and lays with him one night. And then the next night, the younger one goes in and lays with him. And they each had children for him, uh, the Moabites and the Ammonites. Once again, his daughters were delivered out of Sodom. But Sodom wasn't out of them. You and I have been delivered from this world, but that doesn't mean that there still aren't some lingering effects of the fall mm -hmm. or the clinging vines of the fall that still may be wrapped up in there in your heart that needs to be dealt with. But many times we can decide to just live in the land of tomorrow and put those things off, but understand that the, the, those decisions that you make are affecting other people, not just your relationship with God, but they're also affecting the people that's around you, your family, your coworkers, the people that you come in contact with so when you live in Sodom it doesn't just affect you it does not just affect you amen, amen. the Bible says that we walk by faith not sight I don't see Eve walking by faith it seems like she was walking by sight I don't see Lot walking by faith I see him walking by sight and making decisions on what he wanted Amen. We walk by faith, not sight. Your eyes will deceive you. Walk like Abraham did, waiting on God, seeking God in prayer to God. Lord, what would you have me to do, Lord? You gave me the promises. Now I'm going to wait on you to tell me to look up. Now I'm going to wait on you to give me those promises. 
don't, I want to encourage you, don't walk the edge like Lot. I don't know why, but for some reason the church always wants to walk right on the edge. I'm not saying every church, but just people in the church a lot of times. We end up wanting to just walk right on the edge and not trying not to fall off. No, the Bible says, come out from amongst them and be ye separate, says the Lord. I don't want to walk right along the edge of falling off. Amen. I want to get away from right there. I don't want to be right there. I want to let this gospel do a work in my heart, do a work in my life. Lord, set me apart. We are the called out ones. Yeah. We're supposed to be separate from the world. We're not supposed to isolate ourselves from the world. A lot of people, there's people that I know that have decided to isolate themselves from the world and don't talk to anybody. We are supposed to be the salt. We are supposed to be the light yes. of this earth and of this world. We're supposed to be giving the people this gospel message that we have already accepted and that we are, we are experiencing this change in our heart and in our life. But we can't isolate ourselves from the world. We do have to show the world that there is a different way to go. You don't have to live in Sodom. You don't have to live in Gomorrah. You don't have to live out in this world and let those things and those people around you influence your decisions. Mm -hmm. Don't plant your feet too deep in the soil of this earth. Amen. That's what I feel like Lot had done. He, he was, even though, even though I feel like part of him wanted to get out of there. I mean, the Bible talks about him being tormented as he was seeing what was going on. But don't plant your feet too deep in the soil of this earth. Jesus is still coming back. The rapture of the church is still going to occur. And we are going up out of here one day. I believe in the very near future. But if you plant your feet too deep in the soil of this earth. In the, the, you, the roots. You set roots down in this earth. You may not end up making it out of here. Don't plant your feet too deep in the soil of this earth. I see Lot, how he traded his tent. He traded his sojourning tent. They were sojourners. Abraham and Lot, they sojourners. They're pilgrimage. They're, they're pilgrims in a, in a strange land, in a sin-stricken land. This, they understood that this world was not their home. But I see Lot, how he traded off that sojourning tent for a permanent home in Sodom. He had set his feet deep in the soil of this earth in Sodom and it affected everything around him. And my question to you tonight, I know this was a, a very short message, probably one of my shorter ones, but this is what the Lord had laid upon my heart. My question for you tonight is, are you willing to deal with the wages of living in Sodom? Are you willing to deal with that? Are you willing to deal with the, the, the effects of, of living in this world and making wrong decisions. Are you willing to deal with that like Lot had to deal with? I don't remember reading really anything about Lot after it talks about his two daughters uh, having children for him. But understand, the Lord, can make, the Lord makes all things new. I understand that. But it didn't bring his wife back though. The decisions that he made, it, it, once again, it affected his family. And it affected his children because of what they had been seeing in that city and the homosexuality and all of the sin. Are you willing to pay or willing to deal with the wages of living in Sodom? That's what I want to leave you with tonight. Let's just let's go ahead and I tell you what, would you mind, Miss Yvette, coming and playing a song? I just I'd like to being as it was a short message, I'd like to just worship the Lord for a couple more minutes, maybe just one song, whatever you feel. The Lord will lay upon your heart and if there's something in your life, something going on in your life that you've been allowing to, something that's taken root in your heart or in your life, something going on in your life with this world, something that the Lord has told you to leave behind and, and you've been living in the land of tomorrow concerning that and the Lord's been telling you to get rid of it and you're still continuing on existing with that thing. If you feel like you need to come up to the altar, we can uh, pray for you, worship the Lord, give it to the Lord. He makes all things new. Amen. Amen.